Electronegativity is a measure of the tendency of an atom to attract a bonding pair of electrons. If we have two atoms, let's say A and B, when they form a bond, there are actually two electrons involved in this bond. We can show the electrons like this. Usually we leave the dots off and just show a line for a chemical bond. Here is a table of some electronegativities. You'll note the noble gases actually don't have any electronegativities listed. This is not to say that they have zero electronegativity, but remember, electronegativity is the tendency to attract a bonding pair of electrons. As the noble gases tend to not really react, we don't even consider them when we're talking about electronegativity. These electronegativities that you see here haven't actually been measured. It's not a measured quantity. Fluorine has been assigned an electronegativity of 4. The lowest, cesium and francium, have an electronegativity of 0.7. But remember, this hasn't been measured. These are just assigned values for each element. You don't have to remember the electronegativities. If you ever want to know them, you just look them up in a table such as this. But you should know the top four, fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, and chlorine. You should remember those four, and then down through everything else, all the way down to cesium and francium. You can note in this diagram that as we move across the periodic table, electronegativities tend to increase. As you move down the table, they tend to decrease. This is in much the same way as ionization energy, which makes sense if you think about it. Ionization energy is the energy required to strip off a valence electron. Fluorine it's very hard to strip off that valence electron, so it has a high ionization energy. That means it also has a very strong attraction for that electron, so its electronegativity is also high. So ionization energy and electronegativities, they go hand in hand. So how does electronegativity relate to bonding? So let's take our two atoms, A and B. We draw a bond, but remember a bond is actually two electrons. Now if we were to show the electrons, let's say here and here, those electrons are in the middle, on average, found in the middle between the two atoms A and B. This would only occur if the atoms had the same electronegativity, that is, both A and B had the same attraction for that bonding pair of electrons. The electrons are shared between A and B, and because on average they spend equal time with each atom, so we draw them on average right in the middle. This is a pure covalent bond. Covalent because the electrons are shared. Pure covalent because they are shared equally. But remember this would only occur if the atoms have the same electronegativity. We get this in molecules such as Cl2 or H2 or N2. In all of these cases, the atoms have the same electronegativity. That's obvious because they're the same atom. Here we have two hydrogen atoms, two chlorines or two nitrogens. So both atoms have the same electronegativity. But what if one atom had a slightly greater attraction for the bonding pair of electrons than the other? If we go back to our A and B atoms, there's your bond. But if atom A has a stronger electronegativity, the electrons won't be found on average in the middle between the atoms. They will actually spend more time associated with atom A. So we could draw them here, closer to the atom A. Because the electrons have a negative charge, they're taking that negative charge with them. This makes the A side of the bond slightly negative with respect to the B side of the bond, atom B, which is slightly positive. The bond formed is still a covalent bond because the electrons are shared between A and B, but they're not shared equally. 
This gives rise to a polar bond, and in this case, because the molecule is linear, it would be a polar molecule. We describe this bond as being polar covalent. Examples are HCl, H2O, the OH bond in water, and the HCl bond in HCl is a polar covalent bond. In fact, most covalent bonds where the electrons are shared are actually polar covalent bonds. But what if one atom, let's say atom A, had a much greater electronegativity than the other atom? Go back to our A, bonded to B, but this time A has a much greater attraction for those bonding pair of electrons. The electrons would now be so close to A that B has, for all intents and purposes, lost control of the electron that it put into the bond. What we're actually forming now are ions. So we have A now has a minus charge and B has a positive charge. Because the bonding electrons are much more strongly attracted to atom A, they spend just about all of their time there. So A is an anion and B, like I said, has lost control of its electron. It is now a cation. This is your ionic bond. We usually simplify and say that the electron from B has been transferred to A. In actuality, it hasn't been completely transferred to A, because remember B does not have a zero electronegativity. Nothing does. All elements have at least some attraction for the bonding pair of electrons. So sometimes the electron will actually spend time with its atom B, just not very much in this case. So we simplify it and say that the electron has been transferred to A, forming the two ions. What we end up with is actually a spectrum of bonds. We don't have pure covalent and then over here polar covalent and then somewhere over here ionic. We don't have that situation. It's more like this. It's just one big spectrum. We have pure covalent. This is when the atoms have the same electronegativity. When there is a slight difference, we have polar covalent. This is when there is still a sharing of electrons, but it's an unequal sharing. And when the sharing is so biased towards one atom, then we have ionic bonds. You'll note that you can never get a pure ionic bond. It doesn't exist, because a pure ionic would indicate a complete transfer. And as we've mentioned, no atom has zero electronegativity, so there will not ever be an absolute complete transfer of electrons. So we can't get a pure ionic bond. But with this spectrum of bonds, where do we actually make the cutoff? Pure covalent is simply the two atoms have the same electronegativity. Polar covalent, they're a bit different. Ionic, they are largely different. But where do we actually differentiate between polar covalent and ionic? The magic number to remember here is 1.67. What we're talking about is the difference in electronegativity. A difference of electronegativity between the two atoms of less than 1.67, you would have a polar covalent bond. If you look at the electronegativities of the two atoms, and the difference between them is more than 1.67, now you're talking about an ionic bond. To summarize then, if there is no difference in electronegativity, you have a pure covalent bond. If there is a small difference, and remember, by small, we're talking less than 1.67. Then you have a polar covalent bond. If there is a large difference in electronegativity, so we're talking greater than 1.67, now you have an ionic bond. And the last point, pure ionic bond, you can simply never have because nothing has zero electronegativity. Well, that's the video done. If you liked it, brilliant, hit the like button, and leave me a comment too. Now you know what to do.
go hit that subscribe button. We'll see you next time.